when you look back at the entirety of your career, where are the do-overs for you? Like, where are the things that you would go back and be like, I would have never done that, or I wish I had gone <laughs> this lane. Yeah, HQ. The- <laughs> Definitely HQ. Uh, no, I don't... Um, I'm like, I'm now reevaluating my... I think I would still have left Fox. Fox Sports was in a... a uh, transitional period when ESPN, it was time for me. What? Excuse me. ESPN yeah, traded for you, correct? Well, they you tried were... to. And I found that out. They called me that morning. I was still at Fox. I think I was still making garbage time. And they were like, you're going to see an article today. We just want you to know we love you. We support you. And we want you to work here. And I was like, I have no idea what this is about. And then I saw it. And it was like, they tried to trade. I don't even. It was like me and not. Uh, who was it? It was a broadcaster. It was a game broadcaster, wasn't Dark. it? Dark. It was Ian Dark. Ian Dark? Ian Dark. Right? That's his name? You'll Google it. Um, he, it was him. It was somebody else, too. It might have been Marty. I think, Mar- I think Fox asked for Marty Smith, and I think ESPN was like, okay, that's too much. And then they called it off. But the way I actually ended up going was, like, after many times of, like, ESPN and Bill Simmons mainly before he left – like reaching out and trying to make this happen. Uh, and Connor Shell, who was at ESPN at the time, um, Fox was in this transitional period. I knew they were going to hire, they had just hired Skip, I think. Uh, and they were bringing in all of those types of people. Uh, and I just knew I wasn't going to be top of the, they didn't, I was the only one left in New York at that point. They were all in LA. I did not want to move to LA. I still don't want to move to LA. Um, and so I just was like, look, this is no hard feelings. I appreciate everything you guys have done. I'm also just going to get out of your hair and I'm going to, I think I'm going to go over there and work at ESPN. And then of course I got to ESPN and, uh, Connor Shell left and, um, other people left and it, it, they got into kind of a transitional period and I was like, oh, all right. So I don't know that I would say I, if I could go back, I wouldn't have gone because it doesn't I think based on the information I had at the time I made the decision it's still the decision that I would make um I just wish it went a little differently well let's we'll get to that part in a second but what I remember from afar is it feeling to me unfair and pressurized for you to arrive with fanfare and then have people expecting something that popped and it seemed like you had arrived at somebody and I I remember many many years ago in the newspaper industry whenever a columnist would arrive who was being paid a lot of money all the other reporters are noticing what Mm. that person is making Mm -hmm. and I just remember feeling bad for you once your salary was published somewhere Mm -hmm. and now and now I know exactly where and I know by exactly who and I won't forget um that aside I think now that now that we now that you've said that, what I would do differently is I would not sign that contract until it said in it what I was going to do. I signed my contract with ESPN. It was very vague at the time. They did not know. They were like, "We've got a whole video team, and we want to do something digital with you, and we want you to be the face of our digital presence, um, and we're going to pay you all this money." And I thought, okay, well, they're not going to pay me all that money and then not give me stuff to do. So don't just not sign this because it doesn't outline like you'll have a show, you'll have this, you'll have that. It, it was very vague. And I think even the press release when they announced that I was going to work there, I think the quote I gave them was something along the lines of making fun of how vague it was that they would not really tell me what I was going to do. Um, it should have been a red flag. It should have made me be like, Make them tell you what they want from you so that you can live up to it. Like if there's no bar, then I don't know what what measure I'm being judged by. Um, and that ended up being what what hurt me in the end is I didn't know who my boss was. I didn't know what they wanted me to do. I would get like little things that were cool, like, oh, go do the go um, coach the celebrity all star basketball game or the celebrity whatever basketball game. Uh but then, and which was amazing, an amazing experience. And then it was like, and, that, and then what? There was no um, thing. And they had given me a team of people who I could tell were a group of, they had just like laid, basically laid off a division. 
and given like repurposed to those people. So it was a room full of people who make really good sports documentaries. And their way of working was they would take raw footage and cut it into something interesting. And my way of working is like live to tape. I don't want to just record and give it to you and then have you make it into something. I want to make the something with you. That was when you were happiest. That's when you were doing it. I don't like to just be like, blah, 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 blah. Cut that into something worth watching. I want to be a part. I want to help. Like, I sat in on the edits for Garbage Time. Again, I know I did too much. I know I should have let other people do their thing and taken myself away from it a little. But it was like a stark contrast of of getting this team of people that I was, I was like, well, they're not collaborative. I am collaborative in nature. I like coming up with things together. And so what we ended up doing is I like, you know, Ashley Brayband, who was my life raft at that company, um, became she saw me right away. And she was like, I recognize what it is you're trying to do. I align with you and I want to help you do it. And because of her, then we got to the point where we we're like, OK, let's pitch them a show because they're launching this ESPN plus and they're going to need stuff for it. So just like, let's ask if we can have a show on it. Um, and we had to film in like a prop closet, a uh pilot for it just to show them what it would be which I was like you it's just going to be garbage time you just go watch the show um but so we filmed that and then they were like yeah okay it was very surprising to me how easy it was to get the yes but also how much it was like well is this the right <laughs> well, yeah is this what you want me to be are you supportive of this or are you just going to let me do this well that's uh, that is the tricky part I I remember they're still not sure what to do digitally what they they yeah. hire it sounds like they hired you we need to do digital mm-hmm. get the digital woman uh but I remember at the end, after my father had left Highly Questionable, I was lobbying hard, unsuccessfully, ultimately, for so many people like you. There were only a certain number of seats left anymore on television. They had all of these people who they were paying but didn't fit in the places where they make their television. And so I was talking to Eric Rideholm, the producer of Highly Questionable, about couldn't we make it so that it's not just me and Bomani sitting there, but we have a team of correspondents, Daily Show, that are off making their own things and then bringing them to us and changing what the show is. And he said to me, not inaccurately, he's like, well, Dan, those things can be hit or miss. It's hard to make five minutes of television over there. Why can't I just have you and Bomani talk for five minutes? It's easier. easier. And and it. my suggestion might have been better, but it might not have been better, mm-hmm. right? It might have been rejected because the format is you talk on television and people don't want something new all the time. Yeah. And so it could have failed and we didn't end up going that route. But I was hoping to find a place for you that could feel more well, supported you, like that. You were the only, um, you it, you did. Because I felt very like, I looked at the shows they have and was like, I don't really fit into any of these. Um, I could do my version of it, but it's it doesn't um, fit as as like seamlessly and I didn't have anybody who was helping me smooth out the transition anyway so seamless was kind of all I had and you were that like your show became the thing that was like oh okay they get it they're just funny they don't take it too seriously they don't need me to come in and have some take about the defense of some team like they know that there's more to talking about sports than talking about sports and um if it hadn't been for you, I think I would have, I probably would have um, left after the end of my first contract. And maybe that actually would have been better. But it was, uh, you know, doing Highly Questionable was the best and the easiest um, and the most fun. And I'm forever grateful to you. What version of you was I getting? Because I don't know what. What do you mean? I don't know. What There's sta- only one me. Well, I just don't know what state you were in. I don't know emotionally, mm. right? When you're coming on yeah. television, if you're if you're carrying in with you the anxieties of why am I not supported? I've got a staff of 10 people, but we're not making the thing that looks the way and sounds the way that I want it to sound. I don't know what I'm getting. Like you're coming in and you're getting a little bit of the cotton candy vanity television yeah. garbage but you're not it's not your show doing your thing your way the full bloom of your personality the fir- when we were doing them in person when we were going to the clevelander when i first did my like i think we did like a week at a time i feel like my first time was a week but it might have just been one day and then the next time was a week when i came and did that that was i was um i was still like this is gonna work espn's gonna work out this is gonna be great um then when we started doing it pandemic was when you got me who was like what's 
going to happen? Because when I saw, ironically, and to me, I still do think this is kind of paradoxical. Once sports shut down, I felt like I was going to be the first cut. Because you you see like, okay, this network's going to start making cuts because they're they're going to have to. And I'm probably going to be first out because I'm the most peripheral. But I'm also like, yeah, but I'm also, if there's no sports, I can still have a show. So it, it felt to me kind of like it could have been an opportunity for them to be like, hey, you have made a show out of your house before. You worked on YouTube making, self-producing all this stuff. Um, let's have you do that and make the non-sports sports show for when there's not sports. Um, and that's not how it went. Uh, it was the other one where they they were like we're we're good, um, and so I think like you you to answer your question of who you got you got me really wanting to make it work and like ex I was so nervous the first time I did highly questionable, um, and then got comfortable doing it and enjoyed doing it and then the second half you got me being like I don't know what to what I'm gonna do what this is going to turn into and like suddenly the future that I hadn't really thought about um I started to think about more and thinking about the fact that I was like I don't know what it looks like and that scared me I and then so they laid off my co-host of my podcast without telling me and then I was like I'm probably gonna go I think I'm gonna go 